Thank you, guys. I see my circle there from last night. I feel so far away from you guys. I challenged the camera fellow. I said, I'm sorry if I put you in a spot. I jumped down there. I got a little excited. <laughs> I so appreciate it this morning. Thank you, worship team, where you let that whole thing go. I love where we went with that worship and where we ended with Jesus. I almost jumped up right before you sang your uh, 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 We're on Holy Ground. And it's not that anybody did anything wrong. I understand honoring people and, and people that are laboring among you in honor. And I get those scriptures. Nobody's done anything wrong. But let's always remember, like, no man has a thing unless it's been given. There's no boasting in men. Like, he's the main event. Jesus is the main event. Yeah? And we are privileged to co-labor with him. Like, like if, he didn't, if he didn't let you see... You wouldn't see, like you wouldn't know, like discerning. Sometimes gifting, people are like, whoa, they're so wigged out by somebody that has discernment and sees something. But if God didn't let them see, they wouldn't see. He's the main event. He wants to reveal himself through us. Let's get a hold of that, be humbled by that, and not hinder that. Yeah? Because yeah? like you said, you said, man, I feel like sometimes we hold back. It's just, man, I felt like this morning we were just in such a beautiful place. So thank you. And this young lady beside you, I'm going to embarrass her publicly and openly. You have no idea how you've blessed my heart. I asked mommy, I said, is that your daughter? She said, oh, yeah. Doing what you're doing up there? I thought you had training. I thought like you went through a class or something. She said, she said no, you're so good. And there's something about a child, a young child, innocence. And up there, I watched you today. I said, girl. I say, interrupt you, come up and just hug you or something. When the song got slow, you just changed it all up too. You just did it. And then when the song got a little faster, I was like, what? She's just doing that on her own from her heart? She said, no training. I said, man, I thought you were like top grad in your class or something. <laughs> You've blessed my heart, girl. Yeah. All right, man, Jesus, the main event. That's what I was hearing in my heart when we were singing. I was like, man, you are the main event. It just put me on my knees. Seriously, I, I, people, have, you guys have, have honored the Christ in me. You, you've received me last night, you guys. If, 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 if you weren't here last night, the room that was here last night was like, it was just beautiful. And I'm like preaching. Everybody's like, I saw people looking at the, going, And it was just fun, man. I was like, these people was hanging on every word. So I appreciate you honoring me and all, but let's remember he is the main event. You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have discernment if he didn't give it. Your heart wouldn't be alive. Watch, nobody would even want him if he didn't draw us. That's how main event he is. Like nobody comes to the Lord on their own accord. If there, if there wasn't grace and God's sovereignty on the earth, we like Bruce, brute beasts would just walk off by sheer instinct into destruction. That's, that's true. It's his grace. It's his saving grace. It's his drawing power. It's the person of the Holy Spirit whispering and drawing and convicting the world. Yeah? No man even comes to him unless he's drawn by him. You know how much I love that? Because if you have a desire for him, it's because he's drawing you. Why would he draw you? Because he wants you. Yeah, you get it. Now I'm going to get all mushy this morning. I'm going to be like, no, I'm going to be good. I'm going to be good. Thank you, worship team, for this morning. Thanks for not being in a hurry. Thanks for not being in a hurry on a Saturday morning. It's like 25 after 11. Thanks for not being in a hurry. I was going to go to about 12. I might go just a little later. I'm not going to go much later. I just feel like we go get some lunch and... We're having a 6 o'clock tonight. I think some folks will come. I know I'll be here. I'll be here. Since it's my last time, I'm going to make the best. Of no, I'm just kidding. I'm just messing with him. I've been messing with him. I said, no, no. No, honestly, I was wishing you wouldn't even said nothing about that offering. I just slipped away. I said, listen, we don't need no offering at every service. Honestly, it's my heart. I didn't come here for that. I came for the kingdom. Y'all took an offering last night. People so into me. I'm a very blessed man. I'm here to preach the kingdom. And, and I actually like to get in my heart where everywhere I go, it's just not no offering at all. Because sometimes it's almost like, I know the giving, there's a pure side. People want to sow into good ground. I get all that. Pastor after pastor have tried to preach giving sermons to me. I'm like, listen, 
I know the word on this thing. But sometimes it just feels cleaner to just come in with no string attached and just come because he's Lord. Just come because we're family. You know, a pastor will print me an email and say, how much would it cost to bring Pastor Dan in? That grieves my heart to no end that that's even a question. That sounds like a business deal. Yeah, but brother, there's expenses. No, people empower you to do what you're going to do, right? So people don't have to cover all my expenses when I go to their church. If pastor gets up and takes an offering, who's ever heard a pastor take an offering like this? They'll say, who appreciates this man? Who, who wants to sow into this so he can keep doing what he's called to do? Yeah. And then they take the offering, and it's church, right? So here's my question. If people sow into me to empower me to keep doing what I'm doing, why everywhere do I go do they cover all my expenses if I've been empowered? To me, that's just integrity. So I've been empowered to come here. Yay. <laughs> you get it? You know, I've been flying for a long time. I've got over 60,000 miles domestic flights already this year. I'm over 60,000. They treat me like, they treat me like I'm Jesus, like. Yeah, they like, he's coming, here he is. <laughs> I got status. <laughs> she. So I fly a lot. You know, I buy all my own plane tickets because I believe it's right. Jesus will get my plane ticket. I'm going because I want to. I flew out to Oregon last week out of my ministry account so I could pour into a whole bunch of people. That was my payday. Having hungry people come. You guys, you guys, I'm looking at you right now. I mean, he come up and said, hey, man, you just have no idea. Just thank you. Have no idea. Grown man, white hair like me, full of wisdom. Grabbed me, crying. I don't know how many people wept when they met me because they say their life's different. That's humbling when somebody meets you for the first time. They've been watching YouTube, but they meet you for the first time. And the first thing to do is break down and cry. Happens all the time. I'm so humble by it. I'm like freaked out by it. I'm like, what? <laughs> See, I got him crying now. I like it. I just. <laughs> just <laughs> <laughs> it's fun to me. <laughs> Cry, man. <laughs> I just love it, man. When my man came up and come around the corner, cried. Big old man beard. Big old buff man, man. But there's repentance. That's why. There's change. That's why pastor said there's a new identity. Why? When godly sorrow comes into your heart, it leads to change. You're already becoming a different person. You wish you weren't the person you were. That separates you from them. Did you get that? Oh, this is powerful. You got to get this. It's the power of repentance because if you don't have that gift of repentance in your life from God, then all you have is regret. If you're a Christian and living by regret, you're missing the whole point. The fact that you regret means you're different than what you're regretting. You're already changed inside. But you're wearing yesterday's garment. If you weren't different inside, you wouldn't regret. You'd say, whatever, glad I did it. Do it again if I had the chance. Woo <laughs> People that, I always feel like I got to jump down. I'll stay up, dude. If I go to jump down, just tell me. Mr. Camera buddy. I do. I feel like on these topics, you got to get close and look right at people and kind of walk halfway up the aisle and look at somebody and they go, I feel so far away right now. <laughs> no, I'll be all right. I'll, I'll come down if I need to. I'm about ready to jump. But you all with me? Like condemnation, condemnation. Who's ever seen a Christian walking in condemnation and actually feeling like they have a valid reason for being condemned. I'm like, no, 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 stop. So, because when you're condemned, it leads to everything negative. So when you're condemned, you believe the worst about yourself. You believe you ain't for real. You believe you ain't never getting it right. You believe you ain't. And the reason you're condemned is because you're alive inside and you care. 
the more you believe condemnation, the more believe you don't care, and the more believe you something's really wrong with you. Condemnation is never, ever, 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 ever God. The fact that you could even be condemned means you're legitimately sorry in your heart and wish things weren't the way they were. Condemnation is the trap. It's the devil's plan to keep you where you've been in your mind and your identity so you wear the thing that you never look good in. Oh, I'm coming, thanks. <laughs> Thank you for the encouragement, the pom-poms. Woo! Ooh. <laughs> yeah. Condemnation is such a wretch and such a lie. People that have something good in their heart, God's made a draw on something good in their heart, get shifted into guilt, condemnation, and shame. It's the biggest trap of hell. It's the biggest lie of the devil. God does not subcontract the devil. God does not use him on your behalf to come for a season of guilt. Guilt, condemnation, shame are not in the tool belt of the Lord. They're anti-finished works of Jesus Christ. They are never, ever, ever wisdom. They are never, ever, ever the will of God. They are never, ever, ever part of the way. Guilt means you're not forgiven. Guilty, not forgiven. Judged for what you've done. Guilty. Anti-finished work. then that takes away your identity of sonship and belonging and acceptance. So when you're living guilty for what you've done, the sorrow in your heart, Scripture says, is enough. Because you can't change where you've been and you can't change what you've done, but you can change. And when you're sorry, it's already happened. Are you with me? It's so liberating. It's not any heavier than that. Yeah, but I feel like I gotta cry for three days at least. <laughs> I don't know what we think. Guilt, subconscious confession that you're not forgiven. Condemnation, subconscious confession that your life is worthy to be judged. Jesus himself said, I didn't come to judge you, but I came that you might be saved. You're gonna have my word that'll judge you in that day. God did not, did not, did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through his son the world would have life. Condemnation is never the will of God. Shame. You know what shame is? You're saying the thing I'm ashamed of is still who I am. That's why I'm ashamed. That's me. I am what I did. No, you are what you're becoming. And I promise you, in Christianity, when godly sorrow hits your heart and you see it for what it is and you wish you never went there, God will never judge you for being there. So if God will never judge you for being there, why are you living as if you're there? Why are you even living as if you've been there? Why don't you let this mercy, this freedom, this forgiveness, this remember your lawless deeds no more covenant Put such a diligence and vindication in your heart and a yea, God, you have justified my life. It should make you run to him with joy and camp on his lap. Now you're going to have to move me, but get there. <laughs> it should make you run to him, never run from him. Never be in an intimate worship time where this young lady allowed it to go this morning. Very intimate, very upward, very holy, very Jesus, you're all that and more, right? And all of a sudden you can't do that because you have second thoughts about yourself and you don't see yourself the way he does through his blood and sacrifice when he already knows your crying out heart, your godly sorrow on the inside. Come on. Some pastors are afraid to preach this thing because they think it'll make people lackluster and think like whatever about sin. Are you kidding me? I didn't find a way to sin and get away with it. I found a way to live free. I found a way to have my conscience clear and my face unveiled. I found a way to be close to God. His name is Jesus. He's the way back to the Father. Now we've made him the way to heaven, very impersonal, self-serving. He's the way back to the Father. 
That's why so many people have a confession of going to heaven and don't have an intimate relationship with the one that paid for it. Yeah? <laughs> Did I just growl? Did I? People come up to me and do things I must do. I'm not even aware I do it half the time. I just, I just feel a lot of things in me right now. And I guess one of them is... Rrr, rrr, rrr. You know, it's a lie. It's a lie. It robs people. So you have a confession that you're going to heaven, but the heaven's on the earth and the kingdom of God's in you. And we're supposed to live. Kingdom of God is here and at hand. And we've turned it into a physical destination in a point in time when the trumpet blows or the bell rings. No, Christ is in me now and he's the hope of glory. I didn't wake up to wait to go to heaven when the time comes. I woke up to live with him and walk with him and live by the Spirit. For those who live in the Spirit won't even fulfill the lust of the flesh to walk in the light as he's in the light. Yeah? Yeah. That's why we're Christians, guys. And guilt, condemnation, and shame will take you from that place where you won't feel about yourself how he sees you. Where you won't have confidence and come boldly into the throne room of grace, Hebrews 4. You have a high priest, he's Jesus, the Son of God, who's passed through the heavens, sitting at the right hand. And you see that you have a representation there. Representing all man to God. Paul said we have one mediator between God and man, and he's the capital M-A-N, the man. Isn't that something? People get mad at scripture. They, they, they attack you for preaching scripture. You say he's, he's the man. You say, well, he's still God. He's the son of God. Nobody said he's not the son of God. Relax. <laughs> That's right. But you have to understand he's the man. He's still a man. Flesh and blood. He said, feel me after he raised from the dead. Touch me. For a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone as I. What's he trying to say? Oh yeah, I'm king of kings and lord of lords. I'm the name above every name. I'm the son of God. I'm the one who was and is and is to come. And nothing was made that wasn't made through me. But make no mistake about it. I still have a body. I see myself as the son of man slash son of God. And I'm going to sit at the right hand of God with my blood on the mercy seat. And sit down on that blood and forever with my life promise that everything I said shall be upheld he said touch me a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone as I why would he do that why would he take the time to do that because he's trying to say I still have a body I'm representing you in the heavenly tabernacle and that's a big deal yeah? yeah? His blood on the mercy seat of heaven. The thing that Moses made a replica of. The thing that Moses saw and modeled. Jesus is in the real deal. With his blood on the mercy seat, speaking better things over men. You have a mediator, a go-between, an intercessor. We always teach he's up there praying for us. The word intercession means a mediator. He's there on behalf of representing us to the Father. That's what the word intercession means. It doesn't mean he's praying for us. It means he's representing us. And he's sitting there at the right hand so that we have access through him to the Father. Come on, if that's true and we have faith, we ought to be with the Father. I hope you woke up and said, good morning, Father. Hey, I love how you love me. I so appreciate you living in me by your spirit. Thanks for seeing me clean. I so appreciate the forgiveness of everything I've ever done so I can get on with life and truth in you. And now I got the present and things to come. Yay, God. Come on. That sure beats, oh boy, six o'clock. I didn't sleep real good. God, I'm going to need your grace if I'm going to get through work. <laughs> That's a little different mentality than where I'm coming from. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have fun this morning. <laughs> Come on, such a self-centered. Sometimes the only prayer that we know is our need list. The things we need God to do for my day to go the way I hope. 
that is impersonal, that doesn't build relationship, and it can actually let you down. The next thing you know, you'll question where God is. Why ain't my prayers working? How come he never moves? Why is that light always red? I spoke to it three weeks now in a row, and it's always red. Well, good, it's red. That means somebody else's is green. You ought to be happy. <laughs> Prefer one another. Somehow we think spirituality is like light change, Jesus' name. Woo! And we don't even understand. When yours is green, somebody's red, but you don't seem to care. Circle Walmart, praying in tongues for the best parking spot. When you're in the best one, somebody's in the worst. Why don't you park there? It's amazing how we turned him into favor and blessings, convenience, provision. Instead of transformation, life change, love, mercy, forgiveness, and peace. The things that really matter. <laughs> Yay. I love the gospel, man. It makes so much sense to my heart now. I think I see it clearer after 26 years than I've ever seen it. You can tell time has calmed me down a little. I'm a little, little wore down about it. Oh, it's getting a little familiar. Yes. This truth's never going to change. It's never going to get dull. The fact that he loves you should be fresh every morning. You got to stir that thing and keep it alive. You know, the Ephesians church were doing everything cookie cutter perfect, but they forgot their first love. They learned how to do church and stopped being her. Don't forget your first love. Don't go through the motions. Don't let ministry take the place of knowing him. Don't let your church attendance take the place of knowing him. Watch this. Don't let your daily devotion take the place of knowing him. You can do your daily devotion and never connect with God, communicate with him, or be personal. You can listen to songs that sing about him all day and think that's Christian and never contact God. You can listen to sermons all day and never communicate your heart to him. So you can listen to songs about him all day. You can listen to sermons about him all day. You can go to Bible groups where they're talking about him all day and let that take the place of actually having a relationship with him to where you know him. Knowing him will change your life. Knowing about him will convict your life. And in time, it'll turn on you because you'll say everything you know you don't see in your life. And I've been hanging around this thing five years. How come I'm not different now? Wow, I mustn't be able to, I'm just never going to get this. Wow, I've been hanging around so-and-so. I've been listening to so-and-so. Wow, if I didn't get it by now, I'm probably not going to get it. And all of a sudden, you got yourself deceived because you never pursued him. You pursued knowing about him. Knowing about him and knowing him is two totally different things. I could, you know, with today's social media and stuff, I could probably track somebody down in here and find you and read all about you and check out your bio and look at some of the stuff. I could read your posts and I can do all that stuff. And I can actually feel like I pretty much know who you are and know you by all the stuff I'm searching out and reading and exploring. But until I meet you, touch you, shake your hand and look in your eyes, I can't say I know you. I'm limited to knowing about you. Yeah. Yeah. Let's not just settle for information. He paid a price for you to know him. I'm talking to young and old alike. Don't say, well, I've been in this thing 50 years. I mean, I've been doing church. Make sure you ain't just doing church. I don't care you've been in this thing 50 years, man. It should be fresh. Your heart should be alive. There should be a tenderness in you. You should look at people and see what he sees, right? If you've been in this thing 50 years and on the right track, that's a long time to get cultivated and formed and fashioned. I've been in it 26. I'm thinking, man, 26 for now. You think I'm bad now? You concerned for me now? <laughs> 26 years from now? Oops. <laughs> I tell people all the time, well, I'm going to be this way every time you see me or a little worse. Why? Because I just might know him a little more. But I'm not going to know him less. You just can't take away relationship. I know him and he's good. And he loves me and what he says is true. He's never going to go back on his word. He's never going to turn tables on me. He's never going to do anything that would violate or break my heart. 
His love never fails and there's no turning or shifting a shadow. That's why he said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Why? Because he's the one that's truly trustable. He ain't going to play charades. He ain't going to jump ship. If he said he loved me today, he's absolutely loving me tomorrow. If he said he's with me, he'll never leave me or forsake me. If he said he's here, he's close as the mention of his name. Now, there ain't nobody been quite that faithful in my life. (laughs) But he has. So you see what's wrong with me? You see why I'm not trying to like work it up? I can hardly calm down to talk about it. I got to calm down to talk about it. I'm being calm. No, I'm being super calm. I'm talking on an airplane. People say, whoa. Wow, you're, they lean, they try to get over on the other seat. <laughs> no, it happens. They say, you, wow, you're really passionate about it. And I say, passion? Oh, my goodness, I'm sorry. Do you see passion in me? Because I think I'm really playing it smooth. Because I'm trying not to freak them out. I want them to hear what I'm saying, not get caught up with emotion or passion. So I'm trying to play it cool, and they're going, whoa. <laughs> so on my coolest day, they're going, whoa. And I'm thinking, man, wonder if I would just come out like I am. I save that for when I'm alone. I tell a story all the time about a mother and her girls coming by a back road. They were, well, two girls and a boy. They were coming in the van, and I was their pastor, and they were young. She's a single mama. They loved me. I poured into them kids. Most of the time, they loved me. (laughs) And she said, we were taking a little back route, getting out of the city, missing lights, taking the little, it's a little longer, but it's quick, and. She said, look, here comes Pastor Dan. Here comes Pastor Dan's truck. It's Pastor Dan. And they're all up at the window. I've never seen them. I'm going by. They said, I'm laughing, talking. And ain't nobody in the car. They went. She said, her kids just got silent. She was a smart mom. She just drove for about a quarter mile in the quiet. After about a quarter mile, she said, well, kids, now you see why he is that way. She said, and there's no reason all of us can't have what we just saw him having. It just starts with faith. Guys, we just saw firsthand. She told me they passed me. I said, where? Oh, I'm so sorry. She said, oh, no. It was so God. It was so powerful. You didn't have a clue we were on the planet. (laughs) She said, you were laughing like just your hand was going. You were laughing and talking. And there was no one in your vehicle. I said, oh, yes, there was. <laughs> Woo-hoo! But it's a good, good, good thing for her children to see. So I ain't just doing the pastor thing. Not just a leader, school, trained to do. Living in my position. Come on. <sighs> yucky y'all all right look we already did enough this morning man we could just go man I'm like what this is good I want you to see something though we can't go yet in all that I had already said today it's been about 25 minutes I've been talking If you believe you don't have access to him or you can't be with him like that, I promise you you're being deceived. It's feelings, wrong beliefs, wrong emotions, self-consciousness. I promise you it's not true. He is waiting for you to come to him all alone. Not corporate. Just you and him. I promise you he's waiting. He has paid for that door to stay open. You don't have to knock. He ain't going to be on the phone. He ain't going to be texting while you're talking. (laughs) Checking his Facebook. (laughs) Nope, he'll look right into your face as he lets you look into his. 
And it says, no man ever looks into his face and lives. That's the goal. Long time ago, long time ago, 26 years ago, I opened my Bible to read and he said, I heard whisper in my heart. He whispered in my heart words. Sound like my thoughts, but they were strong. You know what I'm saying? Wasn't out here. It wasn't like, it was just thoughts inside. But they were first person. I was opening my Bible. He said, this is your face-to-face -face encounter with me. Because I knew when I'd read my Bible, I would find him. I was reading it to know him. You know what he told me? He told me I'd be doing this. What I'm doing today, he told me a long time ago I'd be doing. I was three days saved. He said, I'm going to put revelations of my love and righteousness in you. And you're going to speak to many of my people. And I'm like, what? so not educated. I went to city schools. Curriculum is lowered to get us through. I got alcoholic dad. I got a sick mom who I have to carry to bed and change her diapers when I'm available. I got stuff going on in my life. I'm growing up in the city. I got pecking order. You got alpha dogs. You got I ain't worried about school. School's a dread. 2,700 kids, bullying, picking. I just want to get in. I just want to get out. College, are you kidding me? Last thing on my mind, city boy. I couldn't wait to get out of there. God said, I'm going to put you in front of people. I'm like, what? I ain't even good at math. I can just balance my checkbook. <laughs> never was even good at long division let alone algebra and geometry <laughs> here's what he said I don't ever he said I don't ever want you to read your Bible to preach a sermon he said only read your Bible to know me and only ever speak out of who I am in your life and that'll carry weight to open eyes and change hearts. And I said, okay. So that's what I've done ever since. So I opened my Bible one day. He said, this is your face-to-face -face encounter with me. And I was like, oh, I love this. I was moved. I was emotional. When God speaks to you like that in a secret, you just cry. You laugh. You cry. You just get beside yourself and people wouldn't understand. So it's good you're alone. He said, this is your face-to-face -face encounter with me. And then he whispered and said, and no one looks into my face and lives. And I went, whoa. Because it's the whole goal of the cross. You becoming what he created you to be. Never again living the person you were born into through Adam. Never believing this is normal. Never believing this is just the way we are, you know. Never turning this into psychological study. Dead. Transformation of life. I got scripture for it. Old things passing away. Behold, all things becoming new. He's not talking about the boo-boos and the bad stuff we did. He's talking about all things. You said it. Your will be done on. Isn't that how he said to pray? Your will be done on as it is in. No animosity in heaven. No backbiting. No competitiveness. No jealousy. No tit for tat. He said, she said. Well, what about me? Well, I won't. Well, how come they? Well, God. Gabriel, God, Michael always thinks he's the best. <laughs> now, boys, boys. <laughs> Your will be done as it is in. Why is that his prayer? Why does he say that? Because God made man in his image. The psalmist says it like this. He says, what is man that you're so mindful of this guy? That you would consider him, that you would visit him, 
that you would give him dominion over the works of your hands, that you would make him your crowning creation and glory. What is up with this man? He made man to multiply who he was through them. He gave you a body which he doesn't have. Jesus took a body. God doesn't have a body. God's spirit. God gave you a body so you could act out what's on the inside. Your body is the manifestation of what you carry. You know them by their... You're a tree of righteousness, the planning of the Lord, that he might be glorified. What do you do? You live in righteousness. What is that? That's the expression of the nature and character of God. It's the work of righteousness. It's the fruit of righteousness. It's what hangs on your life from being made right with him, by him. And all of a sudden, your life looks like him. You get it? Here we are in good works, good faith, we call it, trying to change ourselves, trying to change our actions, trying to get a grip on sin, waking up trying not to sin, seeing how far we can make it today. You'll be so self-conscious and so sin-conscious and so messed up. You'll be so judged. You'll be so messed up. Because as a man thinketh, and we don't even understand this thing, so we argue over how to preach it. Listen, it's a work of grace. When I believe what he sees and I believe what he says, what he sees and says becomes a real expression in my life. Why? Because he empowers me to become what I believe. So if I see that I'm righteous in him and I'm a tree, the planting of the Lord, my life is the will of God. His will is my will now. All of a sudden, his purpose is my purpose now. All of a sudden, self-centeredness is swallowed up and I have this real goal in life to live what I'm here for. I'm not on a search. Life's not an experiment. And I'm not wasting time searching. You get what I'm saying? I'm redeeming the time because the days are evil. I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. He brought me out of darkness into the light, translated me into the kingdom of the son of his love. That's the gospel. It's all here. Yeah? There ain't no reason we can't put this thing on. And quit fighting over it, arguing over it, and not believing it. Yeah, but you don't know where I've... That's what we're talking about. He already does. You're sorry. You wish you didn't. Get over it. Die already to that thing. And step over here into new life. And give grace an opportunity to shape you and mold you into what he created you to be. Ephesians says, you're his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. What comes before good works? See, you don't do good works to try to be his workmanship. You be his workmanship and it empowers you to do good works. Which were predestined beforehand that you should walk in them. So why are we on the earth? To walk like he walks. To live like he lives. Good works, right? To manifest Christ. That's why we're on the planet. But you're not going to do it apart from workmanship created in Christ Jesus. So you got to call old things dead. you got to call all things new. When you get born again, I wish this stuff was just taught like all the time. How come this stuff gets pushed under the rug? How come this stuff isn't talked about? How come we're just trying to get people to heaven and say, now look, you're going to still make a bunch of mistakes, but God still loves you and just call on the blood, brother. Thank you. It was coming. No need to double hit the growl. You say, what are you saying? You don't make mistakes? I'm saying I don't even think about it. And if I would make one, I'd be aware of it so quick because of my relationship, my conviction, my conscience. 
But because I don't even think about it, I find myself, we can't even talk about this stuff. Everybody wants to crucify you for talking about it because people are living in the dark, condemned. They're letting their own life be their own theology. Pastors can't talk about it because they got secrets. I've had pastors tell me, you can't preach this. Everybody has their stuff, brother. So, okay, pastor, what's your stuff? Because I'm going to leave your church here in a minute, and you're going to be in the pulpit preaching, and you got your stuff. You probably ought to talk. It's, whoa, what? Oh, come on, brother. Everybody got their things. What are you talking about? See, when you teach that, then you permit men to stay there. And when they stay there, here's what happens. They know it's not cool, and their conscience vibrates and grays out. And when their conscience gets violated, their faith gets shipwrecked and a veil rolls down over their face. And they can't go like this when nobody's looking because they don't see that they're clean. They see the secret. How's that for straight up preaching? (laughs) So if I got pastors telling me to chill on what I'm preaching because it ain't real, you got to keep it real. I think Jesus is real. I think the life he lived is real. I think when he said, follow me, he was keeping it real. I think when he said, the things I do, you'll do if you believe, he was being real. See, if you, uh, so everything out there is after what you believe. Don't you sell out your believer. Don't you let your believer get molded by other things. Come on, your believer is important. Don't you give your believer away. Don't you just read a little something and then buy in. You be with him. You let him convince your eyes. You let him convince your heart. You get alone with him and and you tell him you just want to see what he's saying. Apart from all the influence you've been given, not that men are evil and wicked, but man, I've heard a whole lot about you from a whole lot of people. Would you show me who you are firsthand? Let my heart see it. Let my heart know it. Points of no return. Convince me. I want to know you. You start talking to God like that and watch what happens. And then you'll get all, and you'll be like, now I understand why you had so much trouble. (laughs) And had to like calm down to communicate. Because it's good tidings of great joy. It's joy inexpressible. What, What does joy, what in the world does joy inexpressible look like? When people are bothered by every turn and corner. When they're fearing tomorrow and can't even live today with purpose because tomorrow already has them consumed. So tomorrow swallows up today and then tomorrow's always yesterday. Are you with me? Let's put on a healthy identity this morning. Let's look at Colossians. I'll show it to you real quick. There's a lot of things I would love to show you. I just don't know. Well, we're not in a rush. Nobody's that hungry right now. I can tell. (laughs) We'll feed you the word. We'll take the spiritual route. I have food you know not of. (laughs) We'll take the spiritual route. You cool with that? (laughs) Whew. Ain't that something? They they came back with all that food. They were like so taken back that he was talking to a Samaritan woman. It was so not cultural cool. But nobody dare said a word to him. That's how trouble starts. You see some, you don't even address it, you don't even ask. And you're like, I wonder what I was doing. I wonder what, man, we don't want We gotta post that. Let men decide. Isn't it amazing that Paul said, don't be wise in your own opinions, and most Christians are trapped in an opinion for, opinionated forum. Just reading every man's debates, opinions, comebacks, adding their two cents, and letting the whole day go by just debating over topics. 
Paul said, don't be wise in your own opinion. It doesn't surprise me that there's an opinionated platform created for men and people seem consumed by it. I'm not trying to be mean, but some of us need to put that thing down and go out and just love somebody and look in their eyes and tell them Jesus loves them and ask if you could bless them and pray for them. That's called keeping it real. I'm not against technology, but I'm not sure we're able to handle it. And we get consumed by it. If your identity is not solid, you'll find it in something. Something's telling you who you are and what you want, what you desire. It's not you. It's influences. It's because we're clay. And you get influenced. Something is, is influenced you to be whatever it is you are. You're not in control. People think they're in control. You're not in control. Something is deciding you. Did I turn you to Colossians? You are quiet. You're like, I'll back off. I'll back off. Down boy, down boy. Whoa. 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 I'll be gentle. Colossians chapter 1. Oh, this is good. I was going to read 21, but 13 just bombarded me. Look at verse 13. I wasn't even going to read this. It just bombarded me. I got a colored rainbow. That's really good. Rainbow's good. My Bible's so pretty. Look at my Bible. All them colors mean something. Look at this. Oh, my goodness, there's that much in there. No wonder I hope my Bible and preach and don't move, you know, like, it's just there. Look at them beautiful colors. Oh, he has delivered us from the power of darkness. Wonder if a Christian would actually just believe that. That God is light and there's no darkness in him. He's delivered me from the power of darkness. Darkness doesn't have the upper hand. Darkness doesn't have a strong play on me except for Satan roams around like a roaring lion. He's looking, he's crafty, he's seeking who he can devour. He's looking for people that aren't totally yielded, totally surrendered, don't totally understand so he can destroy through the lack of knowledge. Yeah? I wonder if you'd just get on with God and say, you know what? I don't need deliverance. I've been delivered. See, we just think because we don't feel good, we're not good. No, if you don't believe good, you're not good. Sometimes you let your feeling decide your belief. You need to let your word decide to believe. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. Faith doesn't come by assessing your emotional makeup in the morning. Not being mean, being real. Because all of a sudden you don't feel, and you relate to two weeks ago when you felt this, and boy, that was hell. I barely made it through. Oh, God, please. You got to do so. I don't even know. Maybe I should just call off. Can you pray for me, Sally? Can you pray for me? Sally's always my, so she's the one I always use. I finally met her. And she's adorable and precious. So I just, I knew I was using Sally for a good reason. I was always like, Sally, can you pray for me? <laughs> <laughs> but watch this after time if Sally's not sharp Sally will just okay Sally becomes your prayer warrior person of prayer Sally puts on the identity of prayer warrior and maybe you don't even need prayer you just might need a boost of strong truth maybe it's not about feeling different it's about believing different and finding a place of communion and fellowship with God in the midst of the challenges yeah to where you don't pick up your phone and even call Sally, even though she's amazing. It'd be great to say, good morning, Sally. And she'd say, hey. And be sweet. But maybe that's not the, maybe the point is, wow, Father, I just thank you that today is a gift. And your soul's feeling what you're relating to two weeks ago that was really hard. And man, what a day. And, and you're like, God, I just thank you for the grace on this day. And I thank you, God, for an identity in Christ that's just alive in me. Man, I see why I'm here today as a gift. And I'm embracing it. Your grace is more than sufficient for my life today. And you're heading to the bathroom getting ready for work. That sure beats falling apart asking for prayer. That's called faith. It's not denial. It's not stuffing feelings. It's letting truth overtake the situation. Casting down every thought and imagination that's trying to rise above God. And bringing every thought into captivity and obedience according to Christ. 
It's the weapon of your warfare. What's your warfare? The devil? What's your warfare? People? No. Your fight is fighting the good fight of faith. Making sure that nothing you're going through changes what you believe and how you're pursuing it. Your fight is the good fight of faith. Your fight is not the devil. I understand there's a wrestling that's not flesh and blood. It's powers and principalities, but it's not your fight. Your fight is the good fight of faith. He never told you to fight the devil. He told you to remain in faith in the face of the devil. First Peter 5, the roaring lion thing. Satan, the roaring lion, seeking who he may. Resist him, standing steadfast in, not faith, the faith. That means the perspective and attitude that every Christian should have. That they're dead to themselves. They're alive unto God. They love not their own life unto death. They're sojourners and pilgrims. They're in the world and not of the world. We're not here to survive. We're here to shine. We're not here to make it. We already won. Yeah? We're surrendered. We're holy given. We're warriors. We ain't turning back. We put our hands on the plow and we ain't looking back. Come on, this is serious language. First Timothy, it's a good soldier, a good soldier. He endures hardship, yeah? So he can fulfill the will of the one who enlisted him. It's militant language. Endure hardship. We're praying for hardship to go away. He said, it ain't going away. Endure it. Show that you're sanctified and set apart and that you understand that you ain't taking life personal. You took the gospel personal. Yeah? Yeah. And by living this way, it says in Hebrews, they're making a statement when they live this way that they're seeking a homeland. They're pilgrims and sojourners. They're not living for the now. Now they're living for that day. They're setting a table for that day and they're letting every day count for that day. You get it? Boy, that sore beats just sitting and staying hurt for three weeks. Staying offended for four months. Not talking to somebody for 10 years because of what they said and did. And 10 years later, you remember it like it was yesterday. And you told it so many times, you have every detail. And you think you're winning because you didn't talk to them for 10 day, years. And for 10 years, they've been sculpting you and molding you under the tarp. And 10 years later, ta-da, a masterpiece of unforgiveness. They might as well sign their name at the bottom. Because they fashioned you. Whoa. That's intense. See? Nobody's their own. You're clay. Something is forming you. And if he's the potter and we're the clay, we don't make sure he's the potter. And make sure something else ain't pottering me. Make sure life ain't pottering me. Circumstances ain't pottering me. I get so needy that I need significant family members to be certain things for me. And if they're not, I'm failed, insignificant, unlovable. And all of a sudden, I'm gaining my identity through the weakness of men. No wonder identity is weak. If I woke up this morning for you to do me right, then I'm only as good as you're doing me. I didn't wake up for you to do a thing for me. I woke up to shine. I woke up to love you. I woke up to be more like him. And ain't nobody can stop the train. It's rolling. Are you following me? That means I can't be hurt. I'm not going to be offended. I didn't wake up for you to do me right. Watch this. I'm going to stretch you a little and don't elbow your spouse or I'm definitely talking to you. Hmm. Lock your elbows. Get them away from each other. It's good, safe distance. Yep, nope, a little farther. Yeah, stay there for a minute. That's the way my marriage is. I promise you for 26 years. I never wake up for my wife to do one thing for me. I wake up to be like Jesus. So no matter where her soul is, her life, I'm not saying she's a mess or she's, no matter where her soul is, her life is, or his act, her actions, it has nothing to do with who I am or how I am. I did not wake up for my wife to love me. I woke up to love. That's Jesus always. 
We don't understand that because we weren't taught that. We were taught through need. So our I love you, our I love you almost always means I need you. It means I love you for my sake. And if you do me wrong, I'll prove it by the way I act out. So spouses say, I love you. And when they're discontent, they give silent treatments, body language, half phrases. And the whole time we're saying, I love you and proving that we don't even understand love because we're taking account of things we don't. And now we're manifesting. And now we're caught into manipulation and control and emotional warfare. Instead of just letting love cover a multitude of sin. Well, yeah, but then I'll enable them. No, you'll be like Jesus. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so you try to get psychological on me. I'm going to enable them. No, you're going to be like Jesus. I never wake up for my wife to owe me a thing. My wife doesn't have the ability to fail me. We have a really amazing, secure, and awesome, and wonderful marriage. Why? Because I'm on the earth to love her. Because she sees that first love, guess what she does? She absolutely loves me. She would die for me. She would lay down her life for me. And that's not even the goal on my end. On my end, I'm loving her, period. Because she's my girl. You get it? On her end, it's just like us in the Lord. We see his first love, and then he what? He, we see his first love, and then we what? We love him. You know many of us never saw his first love? We just feel convicted? Or we just think, boy, I don't want to go to hell? Or, boy, maybe I'm not getting blessed because I'm not reading my Bible? Are you following me? Now watch this. This thing I'm describing with my wife that's so real and beautiful to me. Zero animosity in our home. You're not going to find animosity in our home. You don't, you don't have to believe me. Critic would never believe me. He said, oh, that's ridiculous. Everybody has animosity. No, you believe that because you have it. So your own experience is your own theology. Ask heaven if there's animosity. Ask the kingdom of God if there's animosity. Guess where the kingdom is? It's in me. Oh, I ain't looking here. I ain't looking there. Kingdom's where? Is there animosity in the kingdom? then I wonder why it would be in me if I'm living from where the kingdom lives. See, the kingdom is the expression of the king. The kingdom is the reflection of the king. The king's kingdom is the manifestation of his kingship. Did you get it? So the kingdom is who he is, how he works, how he thinks, how he loves. And that's in you. And you think I believe that? And I'm going to wake up this morning and set my wife up to fail me because she didn't say something in the right tone? <laughs> or left the house and didn't say, good morning, honey. And now I'm insecure. And by lunch, I'm wondering if she's sleeping with others. <laughs> And then she comes home and we haven't communicated and I'm looking at her through the insecurity and now I'm weird and don't even realize it. And she's saying, what's wrong with you? And I'm thinking, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with you? <laughs> and six months later, it's so bad. We're sitting down for counsel and have no idea how we got there because nobody communicated. <laughs> you can tell I've been in that room before <laughs> as the communicator. <laughs> <laughs> and I just keep things so simple. I say so. <laughs> they come and tell me six months of embroiled chaos. And I say, so how's that change truth? It just shows that you aren't living Christ. You're coming to church. You're just not living Christ. This is easy remedy. Just like he forgave you of everything you've ever did and threw it in a sea of forgetfulness and remembers it no more. Why don't we just throw it all away and call it deception and oops, my bad. Love you. Let's get on track. Give her a big hug, man, and let's go after Jesus. You say, well, it ain't that simple. I don't know. Pretty simple for a young man to come up here sincere last night in the spirit of God to wash him clean. Put a new fresh conviction in his heart, desire, and zeal for the kingdom. Pretty simple for the blood of Jesus to speak better things. 
Took a lot to get us to this point. He paid a heavy price, but it's pretty simple. We step into it. Simple faith. I wonder if you just wake up in your marriage and say, you know what? I'm taking my eyes off my spouse, man. I think I've been deceived in some ways. I think I'm allowing my spouse to influence me in ways outside of Christ. And, and I put expectations that I don't even realize on my spouse. Lord, teach me to love her, her or him like you love me. And just teach me to live Christ in my marriage. Oh, you'd be amazed how you start talking like that and get your eyes off the other and stop praying for them to change for your benefit. Do you know how many prayers are hinged on hurt and pain? You're praying because you're hurt. You're praying for God to change a person because you can't stand them anymore. Because you can't take it. And if God don't bring them soon, I'm going to. So you call Pastor Mark. And it's like me. It's like, be like me. My wife's struggling. I call Pastor Mark. Pastor Mark, can you intercede and pray with me for my wife? What's going on, Dan? Well, listen, man. She's just this and this and this. And I mean, I got so much on my plate. And I'm traveling. I got so much. And it's like she doesn't even care. And if she doesn't get a grip soon, God, God I'm just going to fall apart, man. You got to pray that God breaks her. And he would say, so? <laughs> I hope you would. So what does anything about her have to do with what you're called to walk in? Why are you letting her so dominate your life? Why are you letting where she's not decide where you are and what she doesn't see become your vision if he's the light of the world? Why are you letting where she's at matter more than who he is in you? That's how I counsel. My counseling sessions are very short. <laughs> I'll call you to truth. I'll call you to truth because I'm going to ask you if you're a Christian. And when you say, yeah, then I'm going to hold you to Christ. And I'm going to show you, you don't have as much of a problem as you think. And if you don't change that belief, it'll compound. And then you'll keep looking through the eyes of trouble. You'll stereotype each other. And then there's this weird silence in the relationship. And there's this unresolved conflict. And it's so troubling because your heart feels like you love them, but you don't know where to go from here and you don't know how to express it. And in time, you even question if you do love them and things go the way they go. Ain't that something? Watch. God doesn't even have that ability because of love. It takes no account. And God didn't create us with that ability. We received that ability when we were born into Adam. God didn't make us this way. It got this way. And the biggest lie is we hide behind psychological assessment and we say this is the way we are, you know. Well, we got to, hey, 50-50, give, take. And we study a fallen man and say this is us. And Jesus is over here going, hey. And they knew him not. Come on. I've heard countless Christians say to me, Dan, you keep talking about feelings versus faith. You got to understand God gave us emotions. Emotions are. I said, no, 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 no. Stop. Back up. Whoa, 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 whoa. God did not, let's make this clear, God did not give you the emotional makeup you were born with. You were born into Adam. Adam passed that on to you through a self-centered foundation. Your emotions react through a self-centered motive that you were born with. That's why you were angry before you could speak a language. Nobody had to train you to be angry. They just took the binky from you before you were done working it. <laughs> First things, little children are sweet. But guess what they learn first? No, uh, mine, uh, mine. Uh. You know I'm right. And you see the need for Jesus in everyone. <laughs> and parents think they're failing. They come to me, I think I'm failing with my child. Are they possessed? <laughs> they made a mean face at me. It looked like a demon. No, no, no. Your child's just going to need born again. So don't take it personal and don't get crushed and don't react. Just keep modeling Jesus. Manifest Jesus so that one day at a very young age, your child will say, Mommy, there's something so different about you. And you can sit on the bed and explain what it is. And they weep and say, Can I know Jesus too? You can say, Sure, you can, honey, because all you've done is love them. Because you're not finding your identity through your children. You found your identity through Jesus. Now it's not about failing. It's about loving. 
Whoa. And by your life, you're training them in the way they should go. And when they grow old, they won't depart because Holy Spirit will mark their heart with a revelation. Ain't that something? Yeah. Did I turn you to Colossians? So full of color, it's got to be good. You have, but see, I, I'm, a, I'm just, I try to preach this stuff. It's so, and now I've been talking for a half hour. He has delivered us. That's past tense. What would happen to a Christian if they'd stop thinking they need delivered? And they'd get alone with God and raise their hands in a room when nobody's looking and just say, Father, you have delivered me from the power of darkness. My heart is not to live in darkness, be bound by darkness, remember darkness, or be influenced by it. You're a God of light, and there's no darkness in you, and you're in me, and I thank you. You have translated me into the light. You have made me free. You have forgiven me of everything. wonder if a Christian would say this. You have forgiven me of everything I've ever done. You made me clean before you, clean in your presence. You've accepted me into your kingdom, into your family, and into your love. I thank you for loving me. When I pastored, I asked a lot of Christians if they do that, and they'd look at me cockeyed and say, I didn't even ever think about doing that. I just pray about stuff. I pray for work. I pray for the people I care about. I pray for God to protect my family. I've never talked to God like that in my life. I'm like, whoa. We've like turned him into the meter of our surface needs. And we come to God for what he can do for us and find ourselves very disappointed. We think the preacher lied and God wasn't faithful. And when they're singing, you are good, we're saying, yeah, well, why did I get laid off? That's all around people. Well, I quit praying because I prayed and nothing ever happened. I stopped this and that. I mean, we had, and God never seems to. Do you ever hear that stuff? That's because preachers are preaching a self-serving message, setting God up to fail in their sight and their understanding. I will never stand on this pulpit and say God sent his son to protect you, provide for you, and to bless you. God sent his son to get inside of you and transform your life so you look like him. Yeah? So you can live in the world and not be of the world. So you can be sanctified and set apart. Yeah? He didn't come here to end all your challenges and troubles. He told you full well, scripture after scripture, you're going to face them, you're going to have them, and they ain't going away. But I'm giving you a way to approach them, to see them, and to handle them, and don't be moved. Your life's not your own. Satan's accusing you day and night that you ain't for real, accusing day and night that you ain't sincere, accusing day and night that you ain't legit. You resist him standing steadfast in the faith, and you overcome him through the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony, and you love. Love not your own life unto death. Why? Because you were never made for you. He gave you every answer. That's all scripture. How to defend against trial and trouble. Yeah? I got to, I got to show you this and I'll be done. I want you to see this and I want to encourage everybody into this place of relationship. It's alarming to me as a pastor when 90 some percent of the people that I ask questions. Do you ever just receive the love of God? What do you mean? What do you ever say? Wow, Father, thank you for loving me. No. I pray for my family. I pray for my kids. I pray that my job goes well. But you've never just communed with God and said, Father, thank you for forgiving me of everything I've ever done, washing me clean, and just looking at me in your eyes of love and throwing my past life into a sea of forgetfulness. God, I'm a brand new man. I'll never be the same. You've changed me forever. No, Pastor, I ain't never even thought about that. I'm like, how about thinking about that and praying like that? And just see what happens on the inside of your heart and how your knowing starts to increase. And all of a sudden, you see yourself the way he does. Now you look in the mirror, and it's not vanity. It's not Vogue magazine or GQ or whatever's out there. You're looking in the mirror, and you're going, whoa, I see what you see. You know what I'm saying? Why is this critical? Because the two greatest commandments are love God with everything you are, heart, soul, and strength, and love your because the second is like the first. It's married. It's, it's like the first. Love God with all your heart, your soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as your... Well, wonder if you don't love yourself clear. Wonder if you don't see yourself clear. Well, then you'll look at them through the skew. And the way you see yourself is how you'll see others. 
You're supposed to love God with everything you are and love your neighbor as yourself because you see yourself clear now. If it do you good, walk by that full-length mirror and not avoid it. I'm not talking about figure. I'm not talking about your tummy or your thighs. I'm not talking about your hair texture. I'm not talking about the shape of your nose. I'm talking about the glory that's in you, the love that's in his eyes, is in your eyes. And you go by the full-length mirror and you ain't afraid of it because it ain't about this. It's about this. And you go, whoa, oh, oh, oh. hey, man, I've done this all alone in my bedroom. I haven't done it for a while. I have fun every once in a while. But I, I'll be just, I just, but I believe it. The only thing I do anymore is if I'm in traffic, which all I got to do is come this way. <laughs> and you're looking in your rearview mirror. Do you ever catch your eyes? You're looking in, you just, you know, you're looking in your mirror. And, and all, every once in a while, I just catch my eyes and go, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I see you. <laughs> and he loves that. Like when I do that, it's not all the time. Every once in a while, he'll just, the presence of the Lord will just come in my truck like, love you, boy. He's like, little, give me a little new. Year. <laughs> but I will. I'll just catch my eyes and I go, oh, I see you. And he's like, yeah, I'm right here. I walk by the full length mirror in my bedroom. It's right there, heading out the door. I say, whoa, dude, are you kidding me? What? I can see you understand righteousness. I can see confidence in your eyes, in your face. Your countenance is shining, man. Like you understand God loves you, that Jesus' blood is enough and paid the price that you're redeemed and vindicated in God's sight. You get it, man. Look, dude. See, if you fist bump yourself in the mirror, it always works. <laughs> He'll never play you. Uh, it's the perfect fist bump. It's like, it's like you had it planned out, you know. It's like, dude, I don't even know what you're doing standing here. Man, the world right outside this door needs what I see in you. And I can see you're wearing it, man, with confidence. Your day is going to be incredible. You head out the... You think I'm going to do that, believe that, and be all alone? Look, I'm either cuckoo and I need to get a hobby. <laughs> or I'm believing this thing. And it's going to influence my heart and put knowings in me. You think I'm going to do that sincerely, me and God in the bedroom, and then go out and say, well, that hurt. Well, he said, well, I can't believe they did. Well, I'm mad. <laughs> Not today, friend. Tomorrow ain't happening either. You're going to do that. You're going to walk out. Your identity's locked. You have healthy convictions. You'll actually see the world around you. You'll see people. You'll actually see people. You'll see needs, you'll see hurts, you'll be discerning. Why? Because you're clear. And you're going to love your neighbor as you are. And when you see them, you won't see them according to the flesh. You'll realize they're created for more than what they understand. And you won't be repulsed by them. You'll be drawn to them. Because mercy and compassion will rise up in your heart. Because you'll know if they knew who they were, they wouldn't be living the way they're living. They wouldn't be acting like this right now. And you won't run or turn from them or repel from them. You'll actually be attracted because you have an answer in your spirit. It's called loving the world around you. It's one of the best ways you can love the Lord. Is love the people he paid for. It's more than a song. I love worship. Today was so sweet and so precious. But you can even get religious in that. And you can just say this is loving the Lord. I'll tell you the best way you can love the Lord is when you love somebody he paid for. It's the highest form of worship is walking in what you're here for. What an honor to the king. What a sign of believing. I wonder if you get to heaven and you're guilty of believing him. <laughs> I wonder if he says, Dan Moeller? And I go, no. I'll be like, the, the Bible says, here's how you know love's perfected. That in that day you have boldness in the day of judgment. Boldness. It's a day of dread, fear, gloom, darkness, men freaking out. Read all the scriptures that talk about it. But you can have boldness. How can you have boldness? Because as he is, the whole chapter, he is love, he is love, he is love. As he is, so are we in this world. That is not church attendance. That is loving people. So he says, Dan Moeller to the front. Yes, Lord. Wow, you're better than I thought. 
And he says, well, I judge you guilty. Guilty of believing me. Oh! Because <laughs> if, if I'm guilty of believing him, everything else is in place. Because every promise, every sign, and everything follows the believer. It's really, really important you protect your believer. There's a lot of things vying for what you believe. Even the way you process the things you give yourself to, the sources you're gleaning from. Maybe it's time to turn all that off and just go be with him for a season. Just shut everything down and just be with him for a season. Yeah? Yeah? This is how you know you can do that. Verse 21, this is what I wanted to get to. But verse 13 was good. Verse 14, I'm so distracted now. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Are you forgiven? You probably ought to live that way. You forgiven? Will he remember your lawless deeds anymore? Probably ought to live that way. Sounds like freedom. He who the sun sets free is free. Probably ought to roll back that veil. Just go ahead, guys, and be a bride. If the girls are sons, we can be brides. <laughs> Come on, man. If you've struggled with guilt, condemnation, shame, it would be good to go find a secret place today. Just go get alone. Break through that lie. And believe the gospel. Just get alone. And just say, Lord, emotions will rise up. I'm here. And just do it. Just, just, just act it out. Contact with faith. I'm here. And with open face, I'm coming. And I'm never covering this thing again. Because you love me. Or you'd have never sent your son to the cross. Thank you. Whew. Take some bread. Take the cup. Just have a little ceremony. Almost like a wedding. Father, you vowed to never leave me or forsake me, to be as close as the mention of your name, that your love would never fail. And God, even the way you gave your son and you gave your body, Jesus, I give mine for your glory and your honor, and I separate myself for your glory. And Jesus, the way you shed your blood to wash me, to forgive me, to cleanse me, make me clean, I will not hold my life back even to the shedding of blood. If this thing costs me everything, God, I'm all in to manifest what you paid for. This is a covenant. All that is yours is mine, and all that is mine is yours. I am honored that we're one. You see what, you see what goes on with me behind the scenes when you ain't watching? That's what's wrong with me. But I believe it. I believe her. It sounds harsh, but it's just convicting. Your life lived reveals what you really believe. You know a man by his fruits. In that day, your life will be the verdict of whether you believed. It won't be an assessment sheet. There won't be a questionnaire to fill out. The way you lived reveals what you gave your life to. And if you lived hurt, then you believed offense you're not going to stand before the Lord and break down and cry and say well why didn't you help me I prayed and prayed why didn't you change my spouse you knew how much pressure they put on me and what they it, you you will get in the light of his glory and go oops I was totally deceived all those years you'll know it in a heartbeat and when I use that example, you know you're not going to stand before God and say, why didn't you change my spouse? Because that's making your spouse greater than following him. And you just, you just know that ain't going to work, right? So why would you let it work now? Why would you buy time you don't have to give? Why would you let it work now if you know it won't work in his presence? Come on. Oh, that's good and straight. And you who were once alienated, you and me, and enemies in our mind by wicked works, that's self-centered motivation. That's not just murder and adultery and pornography. It's just, it's just wicked. Unbelief is an evil 
heart of unbelief. Unbelief is called evil in your Bible. It's contrary to the kingdom. It works against his goals and efforts and agenda, right? So we were all alienated in enemies by the way our minds were working. And yet now, in the midst of that, yet now he reconciled us. What's his love understand? I created him a certain way. Adam got separated in sin. They were all born into Adam. They need born again. God had figured out, lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He's going to come, pay the price to remove all the sin, get the lie off of every man to restore him back to the truth. Their minds got perverted. Self-centeredness got in the way. If you're going to follow me, I need you to do this. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross. What's that mean? That means you never let sin against you give the right to produce sin in you. You overcome evil with good. You don't repay evil for evil. You carry your cross. And sometimes you get judged for doing good. You take it patiently, First Peter 2, because it's commendable before God. For to this you were called, as you have Christ as your example, and you should follow in his footsteps. Yeah? Man, that's good. That's scripture. First Peter 2. Can you tell I've read this book? You ought to read this book. It's amazing. Get it in your heart. Fill your heart with truth. How will you ever discern a lie if you're not sure what's true? Do you want to get in a place where it's like... Oh, <laughs> yeah, let's finish this and we'll be done. I bought a little extra time. Actually, I don't think I had to pay for it. You guys seem like you're okay, but I'm, I am trying to finish. I really am. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he reconciled. How'd he do that? In the body of his flesh through death. What's the purpose? To present you? Whew. Now watch this. I don't know if preachers told you this. I don't know your background. I don't know who your pastor was. I don't know who you, where you've been. But I've never been told this in my life. So I'm going to make sure I tell you since I have a mic. The purpose, he did what he did on the cross, is to present me holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. What he's establishing is right identity to restore right relationship to get me past my past so I can be empowered to live my present and things to come in this truth for the rest of my life so if he died on the cross to reconcile me and present me holy blameless and above reproach in his sight which means it's the way he sees me if I fail to embrace that and accept that that would be called pride Humility says, yes, thank you, wow. So who am I to not see myself the way he sees me through the cross to restore this relationship? So when people live outside of holy, blameless, above reproach, guilt, condemnation, shame, contraire, anti-finished work, deception of the devil, it's a, con it's a quandary because their heart's been changed, convicted, and, and touched but they're still weighing themselves by themselves and there's no chance for change. So they believe they're a failure. So as they think is so they are. So every time they live outside of truth, they confirm their worst fear and in time sell themselves when they're not for sale. So if he said you're holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight, wouldn't it make total sense in the realm of faith to wake up that way? Wouldn't it make total sense to live the day that way? Wouldn't it make sense to go to bed that way? You say, well, yeah, but wonder if we mess up. Run straight to him. Don't call three friends crying. If you call a friend crying, that's okay. Talk to him, confess it, stay clean. But run to him. Don't run from him. Don't draw back. Go 
run to him. Well, God, I so appreciate the conviction in my life. Man, that was so not who you are, who you created me to be. And it's not what I ever want to be. God, if it wasn't for the truth that's working in me, I wouldn't see it so clear. There was a time I'd have done that and thought they deserved it. There was a time I'd have done that and thought it was normal. God, that has nothing to do with who you created me and who I ever want to be. God, your word is working in me. You're washing me clean. You are empowering me to live righteous. God, thank you for changing my life. You would talk like that if you just missed it. What would you do? Get condemned, lose your identity for three weeks, backslide? Come on. The godly sorrow takes me to him. The days of hiding from him, naked and ashamed, have to be over because he ended that day when he took off their fig leaves and put on garments made with his own hands. What's he doing? Prophesying a day when we would all wear what he made for us because that's when we look our best and that's what fits us perfect. Yeah? Come on. So he's going to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. Uh Uh-oh. If indeed, see this is where you come in. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast and not moved away from this hope of the gospel which you heard. Do you know people go to church their whole life and never hear this hope? And it's right here. It's actually all over. But somehow it gets covered over and we preach, try harder, hey, you know. So it's either real liberal and who cares and God loves us anyway or tight-roped works, legalism, and everybody's on the fringes of hell unless they do better. It's just so it's a pendulum. And one camp attacks another and the looser they get, the tighter they get. Nobody's winning and Jesus is here in this happy place going, hey, guys, Whoa! <laughs> if indeed we continue, and you know what he's saying? You're holy, you're blameless, you're above reproach in his sight. If you continue believing that and don't let anything change your mind, that's what he's saying. You with me? Okay, so if that's gospel and that's in the word, would it behoove us to live there, to believe there, and to stay there? I feel strong in this, that, that this guilt, condemnation, shame thing, that you're charged with this today, that if an ounce of that tries to come on your life, I'm just believing God's going to help you through today to recognize what it is, that it's dangerous and destructive, that it's not humility, it's deception. And the fact that you care is why you're allowing those feelings to come. Those feelings wouldn't have a place to rest if you weren't sincere and didn't care. So that's already covered. You absolutely do care. So take your care and run to him. Don't run to condemnation. Take your care and run to him. Don't run to guilt. Don't run to shame. As a man thinketh, so he is. So if you believe you're a son, your life starts looking like sonship. If you believe you're forgiven, you'll start living like somebody that knows they're forgiven. Are you with me? Yeah? You believe you're clean, you'll start living and looking clean. (laughs) Yay. Not trying to be clean. Jesus will say, hey, already did that for you. (laughs) <laughs> cost me a lot I really wish you'd put it on <laughs> why are you trying to pay what I already paid for it's free love you <laughs> why don't you stand your feet with me would you let's believe this gospel together just a teaching time y'all got something I know you did I preached way too good for you to not get something Or way too long, one or the other. Hopefully you got some. I preach a long time. (laughs) Who's a... So... This is going to be the joke of the house forever, isn't it? Who stands in front of people and preaches in here? Anybody? You know what I mean when I say this. You you know when it's clear. You just know it in your heart because what it does in your own heart. Like... So when I'm laughing and saying, man, it was so good. I'm not, it's not arrogant. I'm just having fun with y'all. But you know because of what it's like liberating. It gives life. The word gives life. Helps you to see clear, right? So when you hear somebody preaching like this, it's never like, oh, boy, I got a long way to go. Are you kidding? You got somewhere to go. You got direction. You got a light on the trail. You're not in the dark, man. Bam. 
You know, like, boy, I don't even know if I'm barely saved. You know, isn't it amazing how we learn to hear? How we hear people say, boy, you stepped on my toes all service. I'm like, that's a shame. I never even thought about stepping on your toes. I didn't come here to step on your toes. I came here to tell you who you are, and you got your toes stepped on? I don't know who stepped on them, but it wasn't me. It's your own interpretation of what I was saying. It's stepping on your toes. <laughs> I was in a service the other week. These people were off their, off their rockers. They, I was preaching, and they were like, what? Whoa. It, it, was, it was really coming out. It, it was, I could tell it was profound. And they started throwing their shoes. <laughs> well, a couple of people threw money. They came up and threw money, and I was freaked out. I was like, stop. Like, and then they kept coming. And they said, no, we were taught that if we get a revelation, I said, well, guys, you're going to empty your wallets because I'm going to preach revelation the whole time, man. And I was like, and there was this lady said, I'm going to empty all my wallet. And she just kept coming up. And I said, stop. Nobody throw no more money. So somebody threw a shoe. So then they all started throwing shoes. So I'm preaching. I got shoes everywhere. So every time I said something convicting, I just walked across all the tips of the toes of all the shoes. I said, look at this. I'm stepping on all your toes. And I was just having fun. We, this church was off their rocker. They're fun. They're actually a friend, friend church of mine. And they're neighbors. And I go down there and hang out. But they threw their shoes at me. <laughs> they said, you better preach. <laughs> threw their shoes at me. <laughs> I was dodging shoes. <laughs> but I was going to preach. Shoes or no shoes. Amen. Guys, we can live this life. In two sessions, there's not one thing I preach that you can't live if you wrap faith and want to around it. The biggest key to becoming love is you have to want to. You never become love without a sincere yes. If you're still waiting on the person next to you or somebody in your family to change, you're missing the whole point. It's amazing in a room this size how many people don't really want to become love. I've learned it. Make sure that's not you. He paid a price for you to love. Love is seeking not your own and taking no account of a suffer wrong. You stay unveiled so you can go to Jesus. The only way you're going to become love is not because you want to be. It's because he makes you that way because you yield to him. You get alone. You talk to him about it. You talk to him about following him and not being moved like he wasn't moved. Seeing what he sees. Living what he lives. And you start communicating that with him. Start telling him your spouse doesn't owe you a thing. That you're done finding your identity through your children. You found yourself in him. And now you're going to love everybody in your life very healthy and very well. And you just start, nobody owes me a thing. I'm on the earth for one reason, to shine. You start talking and praying like that when nobody's looking. Grace starts to come and form your heart into the thing that you desire. And next thing you know, you're a work of grace. And you actually become the thing you're desiring with without biting your lip to change. See, you don't do love, you become love. Yeah? Yeah. This is all about becoming. It's a work of grace. It's a place of prayer. You all in? Let's pray. Let's pray. And I'm going to pray just believing we're all in. There's nothing I preach that we can't walk in. By grace when it's mixed with faith. And a healthy want to. You make sure you're a want to. Don't be thinking, boy, I hope my spouse is a want to. You make sure you're a want to. Yeah? So, Father, we come to you today and we take these sessions in this word. And I just believe as a room we're saying yes. That you would mold us and you would shape us. We're not going to be stereotyped. Now, I'm just saying this because of things I hear and hear you guys even joke about. Watch this. This is in my heart. We're not going to be stereotyped by the Northeast. We're going to be stereotyped by the kingdom of God. Yeah. We're not here to break a mold. We're not here to even fit a mold. We're just here to become what you always said, what you paid for, and what you've always seen. And God, you're growing us into the truth. And we're kingdom of God way before we're Connecticut. And yet we honor this place and we ask you to ravage this place. We ask you to have your way in our state. But God, thank you for having your way in our lives. I ask that the lives we live, God, would be the loudest sermons we ever preach. And that our lives would bring glory to your name. 
Let there be healing and restoration in homes and marriages. If there's relationships here and you're just listening and you're not even looking to the side at your spouse because it hasn't been that great, why don't you slip your hand into their hand as a sign of saying, hey, I just want you to know I'm hearing this man for me, not you. And I am convicted. Forgive me. And when they do that, when they do that, why don't you squeeze their hand instead of pulling yours away? Why don't you squeeze their hand as to say, ditto, hey, I'm hearing for me too. Things can change. Thanks for squeezing my hand. And give them an extra little squeeze. And I'm telling you, the grace of God will come on your union. And it'll feel fresh and alive. That would be very humble and powerful if you'll do that right now. And God, we just thank you for the redemption of relationships and the restoration of lives, purpose, destiny, and calling, because you're good. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 Love you guys. Thank you.